My name is Tracy Schrader Swartz. I was the first optometrist to be employed by Dr. Wang at Wang Vision Institute in 2001. And I was there until 2008 when I moved to Alabama. And um, we have obviously kept in touch. So I still talk to everyone there and still do some projects with Nathan and Ming and Josh. And so I'm really excited to be involved in this little event that we have for everyone. So today I wanted to talk about um, treatment of dry eye when maybe dry eye is not the reason that they're actually there. So a um, couple of quick disclosures. Um, I do do some stuff for industry. So um, what is dry eye? So I think everyone could probably say this in their sleep, but um, I'm going to use the juice 2 definition of dry eye. Um, it is multifactorial, problems with homeostasis of the tear film. You will sometimes, but not always, have ocular symptoms due to tear film instability, causing hypoosmolarity, causing inflammation, and then subsequent damage. And the neurosensory, neurosensory component is what was new in DUCE too. So, um, but here's the thing that I want to talk about. So I don't think that dry eye treatment is just for patients that are there for dry eye. I absolutely will incorporate what I know about my dry eye and where I've had success. And I try to not do what's not work in patients that maybe are there for something else. So I'm going to show some pictures, go over some cases, but um, there's a lot of reasons why if you develop an anterior segment problem, you are going to have all of the things that are in that definition of dry eye. So um, for example, pterygium or an ulcer, you're going to have a loss of homeostasis of the tear film. You're going to absolutely have ocular symptoms. You're going to have tear film instability, hyperosmolarity. You're going to have inflammation. You're going to get damage if you don't do anything about it. And that patient may have neurosensory abnormalities, which is what got them to your office in the first place. So I don't want to limit my dry eye treatment to just patients that are like, hi, my name is Joe Schmo and I have dry eye. So what are some of the other anterior segment disorders that we might think about to treat the dry eye? So whenever I'm looking at anyone, it doesn't really matter why they're in my office. Some of the, like my hot list for anterior segment signs of when I'm gonna start pulling out my dry eye toys or tests or treatments. So that includes things that I look for on the lid. So I love listening green stain because one, it's really easy to take pictures of people's stain with their camera. Um, fluorescein stain's a little harder because I don't have the light, but listening green shows up, great. So I on the lids, I'll look for listening green stain on the lid margin. Um, I also will look for fluorescein stain on the margin because if they have ulcers, you'll get more of that. Um, I look for scalloped margins on the lid. I look for instillation of the meibomian glands and I'll, I always push on the lower lids of all my patients to see what happens. Um, and when I do that, a lot of times I'll say to them, is this tender? Um, and if they say yes, then my treatment might go one way. And if they say, nope, just a little pressure, my treatment might go another way. Um, if you have imaging that allows you to look at the meibomian glands to see if there's loss, um, love that technology. Patients will sometimes kind of get real agitated if you tell them they've lost their meibomian glands, kind of like they've lost a kidney and you might have to calm them down a little bit. Um, but you also look for debris and demodex along the lash line. Um, relative to the conjunctiva, I look for chalasis, um, which can surprisingly be uncomfortable, um, and um, a papillary reaction on the um, palpebral conjunctiva. I look for injection on the bulbar conjunctiva, and then obviously um, looking for pinguiculas or um, obviously listening green stain on the conjunctiva as well. So. And then when you look for corneas, we're looking for Hudson's Sally lines, um, persistent punctate epithelial keratitis, um, EBMD, Salzman degeneration, patients with recurrent corneal erosions, anyone that's had any type of surgery. Um, and sometimes you have to kind of look for that. Um, I've definitely had patients think they were being super cool and didn't tell me they had surgery and they'll be like, you had LASIK or you had RK and you didn't tell me. Um, and then looking for scars and maybe trying to figure out why they have those scars. It could be that maybe 20 years ago they were in gas perm lenses or maybe they had some trauma. Um, and you can kind of get an idea 
basically what that scar looks like, but you can also ask the patient for some history. And then um, if they've ever worn contact lenses, because a lot of times if a patient's worn contacts, but they stopped wearing them, they're not going to tell you that they're just going to have stopped wearing them. So um, those are a lot of things that I look for when I'm looking at all of my patients. And then when it comes to symptoms, you know, it's not just do your eyes feel dry. Um, I don't a, a lot of times ask my patients, do your eyes feel dry? I do use a speed questionnaire on all my patients that come in for a dry eye evaluation, but I may not have given the patient that questionnaire if they're coming in because they have had trauma or they were referred for an RCE or something like that. So a lot of times I'll say to them, can you read as long as you want? Does the vision get blurry and you have to blink? And a lot of times I do all that when they're reading because they tend to notice it more. Or I may say like, when you're driving home from work, does your vision get a little blurry and you have to keep blinking to make it better? Um, do you have a dull pain or an ache behind your eye? Um, obviously gritty, discomfort, pressure, everyone. Pressure is probably the most common thing that I hear people say. Um, eye pain, heaven forbid, I don't really want my patients to be in a lot of pain. So I might definitely ask about the eye pain. And then have you noticed your eyes getting red and do you have itching? Cause I don't want my patients to be rubbing their eyes. So um, there's a lot of help out there to help you sort of drive the direction of where you're going um, for the treatment. So I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on these, but really quickly, I wanted to mention DUCE2, CEDARS, and the ASPERS preoperative treatment protocol. So um, the DUCE2 treatment, that one is based on subtyping. So um, you use your test to figure out if the patient has more of an aqueous deficient or more of an evaporative tear dry eye. And then based on the severity of the disease, um, you'll decide what to do for the treatment. Um, Oh, there's been you know, so many people lecture on this one, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but um, that was, I really like this one compared to like the very first one that came out in 2007. So the second one is called CEDARS, and um, this was published in 2017 as well. And I do kind of like this one a little bit better for those that maybe don't do a lot of dry eye all the time. And, you know, like you don't have like this sort of absolute like, oh, okay, I know exactly what to do when you're looking at the lid. So this one, breaks the groups into aqueous tear deficiency and then evaporative, but then it actually delineates those of within the evaporative group between goblet cell or mucin deficiency, blepharitis, or exposure-related evaporative dry eye. So, and then in the table, it kind of gives you an idea based on severity, but they call it first line, second line, and procedures of what you might do to help that patient once you kind of figure out what's wrong with them. And so that's one, I kind of like this one a little bit better. Um, then there's the asterisk preoperative ocular surface di uh, disease algorithm. So this one really was developed um, by cataract and refractive surgeons to figure out how to not do surgery on the wrong patient. So basically what this, it's basically built so that if your technicians or if you work up your own patient to you, notice some things on preoperative testing then you would do like a second step to try to sort of quickly assess what to do next. And if you need to actually treat the ocular surface disease before you refer them for surgery. So um, in the keratin refractive and cataract surgery world, all the technicians always do these tests before they send the patient to the surgeon. So they always do biometry. They may or may not do abrometry, but they will do autorefraction. And then typically based on the amount of astigmatism found on the biometry, so that's the IOL master or the lens star, then they might do topography. So for example, in a lot of practices, if the biometry is a diopter or maybe 0.75 um, diopters of astigmatism or more, then those techs will automatically do topography. And then the surgeon can look at the topography and the biometry values together and try to figure out if he needs to do a toric IOL or maybe do lax with a astigmatism correction, incision, something like that. So if you or the technician is looking at those tests and you're having difficulty because you realize the patient's ocular surface is less than ideal, then you would go to the third bar, which is you might um, have the patient take a questionnaire. You might do some osmolarity testing or you might do MMP9 testing, which is like the inflammatory. So um, I do the inflamma dry. I love doing that. The patients all joke that I'm giving them a pregnancy test because that's what it looks like. Um, but um, 
that is also one way that you can really tell patients, okay, like you have something, you have a disease. Like this is something we need to work on because you're not supposed to be positive on this test. Um, so I really tried hard to figure out how to make this slide readable and I really couldn't do it. So um, if you wanna take a screenshot of this slide, um, the reference is on the right because I couldn't make it all fit. Um, but basically using this algorithm, um, you basically, they consider the screen is when you're doing the preoperative testing. So like in an optometric office, that might be when you're looking at the patient's auto refraction. And if you notice the tear film is a little weird or you notice they're injected, um, then you might say, hey, like if you notice that, then I want you to give them like a speed questionnaire or I want you to give them the inflammatory, dry or I want you to do topography or, or do some other testing to try to get an idea of what, how big of a problem you're dealing with. And so basically you want to rule out those patients that you shouldn't send for surgery that need treatment prior to referral. And I cannot emphasize that enough because I'm in that situation where I'm the one looking at the patients that are sent in by optometrists. And I don't want to be in a situation where I have a patient who should have been treated before and now I have to treat them. And then they're looking at me going, well, how come my doctor didn't do this? And I'm like, well, we have really cool toys here. And I, our toys found the problem. So I don't really like to have to do that. So um, I would love for everyone to treat all their dry eye patients I don't have anymore. And then all the life would be perfect. And everyone can do surgery and their surgery results will be fabulous. And that would be awesome. And maybe wouldn't have to wear a mask when we're doing it. So, um, but so one way I think that this is applicable to optometry is um, if you are doing contact lens fittings, particularly scleral lens fitting, because um, you really want to have that ocular surface as good as you can, A, when you're prescribing glasses, because if the ocular surface isn't really primed, then your glasses aren't going to be that great. So the patient's going to come back and be like, they're better, but they're not fabulous. I don't like them. So, um, or if you're going to fit them with contact lenses, you want, again, you want to make sure that that ocular surface is going to enable them to wear those contact lenses the way that they want. So sort of in the same vein of two surgery, do something before you do surgery, it's contact lens fit, do something before you contact lens fit. So that's one of the reasons why, even though this is sort of a surgical algorithm, um, I think it is applicable to optometry. So I wanted to bring that up. So if you are looking at a patient who comes in with, like in this case, this patient has a graft and you don't, I don't want you to just focus on the graft. Like take a look at the whole eye because we know that that graft is going to fail if there's a lot of inflammation. That patient's probably taking one drop of a steroid every day for a really long time. And if their lids are horrible or they have an entropion or they have trichiasis or their eyes really, really red from allergic conjunctivitis, that's going to affect the graft long term. I don't want that patient to leave my office with those things not being addressed. So. Um, one of the things that I like to show that I love this picture because um, in this graft patient, you can sort of tell that like the ocular surface is really thick. And this is one of those cases where when you're looking in the microscope, if you have the patient blink and the tear film is supposed to sort of make this nice wave when they blink and it's supposed to, this patient didn't do that and went eh, and that's it. And when they would blink and sometimes you even get like those oil slicks, they would like, like across the surface of the cornea that's a terrible ocular surface. Like you gotta fix that. So that's just like a really good example of what I'm looking for when I have a patient that has a graft or has a pterygium or they've had DSEC or I'm looking at them for LASIK. I wanna make sure that all of that is better before I send that patient to the surgeon. So um, one example is um, if you have a patient with persistent SPK. So let's say the patient comes in and you've seen them maybe twice and they're just not getting any better. So I think that's when you really need to think out of the box and you need to think about these things on the left as maybe something that's actually the problem and it's not just sort of dry eye. So you wanna like think about those neurotrophic changes, um, doing a Schirmer's and doing um, corneal sensitivity testing. I love doing that on these patients that have this persistent SPK because um, I've actually had some success with um, getting these patients better on Oxervate. But one of the things that you have to do in order to get them to observate is a Schirmer test and a corneal sensitivity test. 
and um, they want you to do it with this super fancy, like fancy, I don't even own it, corneal esthesiometer, but I don't have one of those, but I do have dental floss, and that is the easiest way to check for um, corneal sensitivity, because I don't have time to like sit and make that stupid corneal wisp cotton thing, so I just go grab my dental floss, and I tap the patient's eye with my dental floss, and then I get a new piece, and I do the other eye, and it's fabulous because it, like you can hold it straight out for like an inch and you can bang it on their uh, cornea and it doesn't hurt even if they can feel it so people aren't afraid of dental floss like they're afraid of like a tona pen so it works really really well for that test um another thing that i have learned to ask about and i learned the hard way because i had so many patients come in and see me and they would have this persistent spk and i couldn't get rid of it and Finally, like the third or fourth visit, I'd be like, okay, I don't really understand what's going on. Like, what are you doing at home? Like, tell me exactly. And then all of a sudden they started to mention, oh, well, then I, I, I do my drops and then I put on my CPAP mask and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, you have a CPAP mask? Well, yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now I've learned that like pretty much the first time I see a patient, if it's a second opinion for dry eye, one of the things I'm always asking is, do you have a CPAP? So that a lot of times they'll have like a leakage of the air and it will cause a lot of problems, especially if they have exposure keratopathy and the eyes don't shut all the way. So that's something to remember, you wanna really use ointments or maybe even tape the eye shut for those patients that have the CPAC problems. This patient actually was a patient with atopic keratitis and I ended up having to, the only thing that made him better was lorepredinol QID. And then I just had him back every three months for a pressure check and thankfully it never went up, but um, that is his eyeball. And I saw him at Wang, by the way. So um, chronic sensitivity to staff is another thing to look to look at, to like really look at those eyelids and try to figure out if there's something hiding or maybe something you didn't notice the first time you saw the patient. Because no matter what the problem might be, you want to do something to encourage that wound healing and reduce the friction. Um, so um, I really like um, the artificial tears with omega-3s in them. Um, I think they do a really good job with um, reducing friction in these patients. And um, I'm pretty quick to pull out like some of the FDA approved topical meds for a dry eye, either cyclosporin or lifidograss. And in those cases, I might not even do it just twice a day. I might do it four times a day to try to get these to heal. And then once it's healed, then maybe back off to twice a day and just make sure it doesn't progress once you've taken them back down to twice a day. Um, another thing that I would look at in my patients with pterygium is I want their eye to be as quiet as possible. So whether they've had surgery or not, I don't want that lesion to progress. And um, pterygiums are a lot more common here down south. Um, a, a lot of them may not need surgery. A lot of them don't know that surgery is an issue or an option. Um, but I don't want their eyes to get red. I don't want them to itch. I'm pretty quick to give these patients um, an anti-itch. And I was really excited when Pataday went over the counter. I have tons of patients that are on Pataday. Um, and um, so do a couple tests to kind of see, like do a Shermer, do a listening green, do an inflame dry, kind of get an idea just objectively of like where that patient is and then make them better. So that patient isn't gonna come in and tell you, oh, my eyes are dry. They're gonna come in and be like, this thing on my eyes is bugging me. Um, but you can use what you have in that dry eye arsenal to make this patient more comfortable and to make them not have to have surgery. And then if they do surgery, then maybe you can uh, reduce the recurrence rate of those lesions, which is great because we don't want to have to keep doing surgery on those people. Um, the reason that pterygiums cause so much problem is twofold. So the elevated conjunctiva actually reduces the rewetting. So when the lid goes over that pterygium, it's not rewetting the entire cornea. So look really hard at the cornea that's just adjacent to that lesion. Look for staining patterns with fluorescein, lysamine green. Look for injection like at the limbus um, to see if, you know, if like sometimes it's more injected than others, things like that. I love to take pictures of these people every time they come in. Um, and then the other reason is the pterygium itself is going to actually release inflammatory mediators, which is going to cause physical symptoms. And we want to minimize all of that to keep the patient comfortable and to keep it from progressing. So that's really important to remember for pterygiums. Now, another thing where we might get patients. Yeah. I was just going to interrupt you because you have a few, a few questions that popped up. Okay. Um, so one is, um, 
not necessarily related to the moment, but do you have any recommendations regarding makeup brands and makeup removers? Is there a website or resource that you recommend to share with patients? Okay, so actually I'm gonna get to that. Okay. So can I like just make sure, sure I talk about that? Awful, when I... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Next question is um, for the persistent SPK slide. Mm -hmm. Um you said you perform Schirmer's and corneal sensitivity before they are eligible for a certain treatment. What was that? I didn't, they didn't catch okay. the name. In the Sorry, that's, um, that. that's the Oxervate. And I realized I probably should say that generically, only I don't know what it is. So, um, but it's, it's the new, <laughs> I know, and I'm it's like, like Oxervate's hard enough, I, I don't know. But so, um, but Oxervate is a new medication that um, is used for, um, to improve corneal sensitivity and it helps to regrow the corneal nerves. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier, um, but like that's a good case where I might try that now instead of trying a little prednol for prolonged lengths of time. But it, but a lot of the like the criteria, you know how like we have like certain criteria to do like with photographs. I figured out that's one of those two tests, the Shermers and the um, corneal sensitivity, are required for insurance to do the PA for that med. And then this last question is, um, any substitutes for Inflamadry if you don't have that in office? Oof. I don't know. I mean, I guess, well, tear osmolarity is gonna be elevated if there's inflammation. That's actually more expensive though than doing an Inflamadry. So, um, well, uh, yeah, oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, if someone else knows, chime in. Thank you, that's it for now. Okay, all right. So. Um, patients may present with acute issues like a hordeolum, um, and this is actually one of my um, pediatric patients, and um, this kid was so unhappy. He was about five years old, and um, he had a very large hordeolum. It was painful. The mother had actually already tried hot compresses, and it wasn't getting better, so um, these lid infections are commonly due to staph, corneobacterium haemophilus, or the strep pneumoniae, and um, so I'll typically use like Keflex orally, or Augmentin if it's really inflamed and I'm really worried about sep um, cellulitis. Um, and to be totally honest with you, I have no idea how to prescribe that to a child. So what I always do is um, I definitely found the public's pharmacists are the nicest ph pharmacists on the planet. And so um, I will call the pharmacist and hopefully they work at Publix and I'll be like, hey, this is what I'm looking at. I normally treat it with, you know, Augmentin 875 and an adult twice a day but the, cut, the child is five and they weigh this much in kilograms and can you like do the math for me? And they will do the math usually very happily. And uh, that is, I don't ever have to remember how to do it for a child. So, um, but whenever I see these kids, I always have them back. Like, um, like I, you know, I say, if it doesn't get better or have everybody think it gets worse, I need you to let me know. But if everything goes as planned and it goes away, then I wanna see you in a month because I wanna see what the kid's eyes look like without the acute issue there in front of me because I'm trying to figure out why it happened in the first place. And so um, this child, we actually ended up using um, topical azithromycin for about three months because he ended up having like really bad blepharitis. Um, and it responded really, really well to the topical azithromycin, which is FDA approved in children. And um, I didn't have him put it in the eye. I just had mom wash her hands put a little bit of the gel on each finger and just close his eyes and rub it. And she actually did it while he was sleeping. He didn't even know. Um, and um, that worked out really, really well. And then after about three months of the topical azithromycin, then I was just using hot compresses and he's been doing awesome and he hasn't had any recurrences of the really acute hodiolums anymore. So yay. And um, that's another, I mean, you just don't, don't treat that patient and let them go. Like have them back and try to, do something to make sure that that doesn't happen again because those are not fun. Um, another one, I know we've already talked about this, but Salzman's degeneration. I see that a lot where people will be like corneal haze or corneal scarring and then they won't do anything about it. They just like had the patient come back in a year. Um, and this patient actually, surprise, surprise from the image, had come in for cataract surgery and um, I was like, whoa, like, are you doing any artificial tears or anything during the day? No. Have you ever had any type of dry eye, any drops that you use regularly during the day? No. And I was like, oh, okay. So we actually um, did um, a three month thing of cyclosporin to try to just really get that to 
be as comfortable as possible. And then like every six weeks is having them back in doing topography. And if you ever do this, you can see that when you treat the dry eye, especially in patients like this, the diopter IOL power that you would have ordered initially, it will not be the one that you order eventually. So, um, and the patients always like, I like to do that too, because if I'm putting off a patient's cataract surgery because they came in with complaints about the cataracts, but I'm like, yeah, can't really do your cataract surgery just yet. You got to do this first. And they get a little testy, but like if you can show them on topography and on their IOL master sheet, which I realize you may not have, but just on topography, you can say like, we would have been two adapters off on your IOL. So this was really good that we kind of put the brakes on it to kind of make sure that your long-term outcome is going to be better and they're a little bit less mad at you at the end. Um, limbal stem cell failures are another one where I will go hard and fast on being pretty aggressive with my dry eye treatment because in addition to um, not wanting, like for example, this patient's neurotrophic ulcer, I need that to heal, but like all the stuff that we do for dry eye is gonna help them heal. Now, the one thing you have to remember is a lot of the stuff that we do for dry eye stings. Some of it stings a lot. So you want to wait until those neurotropic defects heal. So like you might do an AMT, maybe a bandage contact lens. Don't do any steroids. Get that to heal. Then go hard and fast on the dry eye. Um, I do like to use a lot of doxycycline, um, but not typical, um, sorry, topical azithromycin in these cases. Doxycycline will help get rid of the MMP9s and the inflammatory mediators to allow the eye to heal. Topical azithromycin stings really bad, and they're not going to be able to tolerate probably putting that drop in that eye. Um, so again, stem cells are really important to keeping the integrity of the ocular surface intact. And so um, if they have a problem with their stem cells, then they may develop a chronic keratopathy. They may have scarring. This patient is a good example of corneal scarring, and it's hard to tell in the picture, but they had a lot of panis. And so um, one study found a whole lot more inflammatory mediators in the area of the panis compared to the cornea that didn't have the panis. Um, same study also found a lot of those same inflammatory mediators located in the conjunctiva of the patient with the stem cell issue, whereas patients that had a normal stem cell didn't have those inflammatory mediators. So anything that we can do to, to reduce those inflammatory mediators like doxycycline, um, autologous serum is another great one for limbal stem cell failures. Um, and now you can get autologous serum, like in Huntsville, we actually go, we have a lab, we work with them all the time. They have their blood drawn and they make it. But now there's places where you can actually order the, the same, same type of product for the patient without them having to go to the lab, which is great if you don't have one near you. Um, I have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, so Dr. Ho is asking, do you have a preference between Shermer versus phenyl thread testing? Oh, I love phenyl. Th that red testing is so much easier. It's so much more comfortable for the patient. And so definitely yes to the thread. And then um, as far as, oh, please review the criteria for having insurance coverage for restasis or Zydra with a prior authorization. Okay, so um, I can't say this works on everybody, but sort of this is like our sort of little tip and trick list for my technicians is whenever I have a patient um, where I know I'm going to maybe down the line or maybe at that visit, I'm going to prescribe one of those FDA approved medications. I always make a note in the chart um, about their tear breakup time and listamine green stain and uh, fluorescein stain. And um, I I got to admit, like I, I usually do those because it's so much faster than doing a Shermer. But if I've had trouble getting them the meds, then I might do a Shermer or the red tet, the string. Um, and then um, I also make a comment in the chart about whether or not they use tears and how often. And then if they failed any other medication, like if I if they were currently taking cyclosporin and I want to switch them to lifidograss, I'm going to make a note of that. So then that's a uh, cyclosporin failure. And then those are all things that when your tech or heaven forbid you go and do the prior authorization, then you can put all those things in the check boxes and you can like make some make notes of those um, in the prior authorization request. And then you're more likely to get the med approved. 
Is there another question? That's it for now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, when I'm looking at patients with um, map dot fingerprint, which is the same as epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, which is also anterior basement membrane dystrophy, or it, I haven't, there's so many names, but, and then sometimes those patients may have the recurrent, recurrent corneal erosions. Um, one, those corneas are not smooth. Um, the cornea on the left is sort of like an ice skating rink that someone's been skating on all day and they haven't had a Zamboni go over it lately. So it's all scratched up and it's harder to ice skate and the, the uh, ice looks real dull. And then, so I always talk about, my patients in the stuff don't understand the Zamboni analogy though really at all. But um, if you can smooth out that surface using tears and you just improve the tear film quality and try to get that um, homeostasis better, then their vision is going to be better and they're going to have less blurring while they're reading or while they're driving and they're going to be more comfortable. Um, and so the map dot fingerprint might be dots like on the right or it could be like the haze which is like right here on that cornea or here you've got like the fingerprint. So those are things you want to look for. If you look at these patients with fluorescine stain then you're going to get negative staining a lot of negative staining in this eye. And the tear breakup time will be terrible because, because the cornea is all bumpy, when the tears go over it, they evaporate really, really quick. And that's why the patient's gonna have some problems with discomfort and they might have actually a loss of vision. So again, they're coming in because like they have an like EBMD, but you're gonna be using all of those tools from your dry eye war chest to make them better. Um, another one that I, this drives me crazy, this is like my pet peeve. So when people, have entropian and they're coming to me and I'm like, wow, like your lid turns in and you know, the person's like, oh yeah, it's been that way for a long time. Um, first of all, I'm really quick to send these people to oculoplastics. Um, they can either do a surgery where maybe they excise some of that tissue or maybe they can do just a cautery and just cauterize underneath like right by that crease and cause a con contraction right there, which will then cause the eyelid to fold back out again. Um, but it drives me crazy because they're, they've never been treated for dry eye before. And part of the reason that that entropian is a problem is because they've had chronic issues with that lid. So as we age, we get a decrease in the elastic fibers as well as an overexpression of the enzymes in the tears that actually cause elastin to degrade. So then that develops into chronic inflammation that just keeps getting worse. And if you don't break that cycle, and the patient's going to end up with an eyelid that turns all the way in like this patient. And that can cause issues on the cornea. They might have hazing in the inferior part of the cornea, or they might have actual scarring, and it can be really uncomfortable. Um, so yes, I refer those patients out, but I'm also going to work on, you know, eyelid preps or um, hot compresses or something for that patient to make their eyelid more comfortable and to get a lot of the enzymes and all the stuff that's making it stick out of there. So trichiasis is another problem. So again, with same sort of realm as with entropian, that if they have chronic inflammation, you're going to get those changes in the lashes. So you'll get the matarosis and the trichiasis, and those patients might keep coming into your office saying like, oh, this, this lash is driving me crazy. And so yes, pull the lashes. Okay, but you don't just do that. Don't stop there. Like, Yes, think about thyroid disease when you have these patients losing their lashes, but you also need to look at the chronic lid inflammation and you have to control that. So um, in those patients, I'm, I'm really quick to offer, like, look, you got to use lubricants. Um, again, I'm a huge fan of like maybe Refresh Reliva with its hyaluronic acid component or um, the Cystane Complete, which has the omega-3 fatty acid in it. Um, I do pull their lids, but I don't like to pull their lids necessarily if the patient's like not that uncomfortable because if you pull the lids, then a lot of times they'll grow back bigger and thicker and the edges, the ends won't be as fine and then they actually come back more. Um, I kind of feel like I'm breaking their car to get them to come back to the garage more often and then I feel bad about that. So, um, and then um, remember that if you have someone with really symptomatic trichiasis, like they can do epilation with electrolysis on those if you have someone near you that does that with um, oculoplastic specialist. 
Um, and then sometimes I've even given patients contact lenses, which like right now I don't do, so I have to send them to one of you all to do that for me. Um, but you know, you just kind of watch those. I, a lot of times I'll warn the patients if they have a lot of entropion or trichiasis that I don't want there to be any gooey stuff in those lashes. So if their eye starts to get kind of gooey and they have like mucusy discharge, I need them to come in. Um, and hopefully they'll come in and then you can fix that. And then maybe you can have a little bit more of an impact when you're like, I need you to fix this every day, not just right now when it gets bad. Um, another one that I like to look out for is the staph hypersensitivity before they develop the issues on their cornea. So um, this patient, um, the lids don't actually look that bad, I guess. They, but like they do have some matterbosis right here. This one's going in the wrong direction. These just look kind of weird, which is why I picked this picture because it almost looks like they're fake. Um, but this patient developed a little um, like infiltrate that then became an ulcer. Um, you've got the limbal injection right here to kind of be like, hello, I'm right here. This is the problem. Um, but so yes, like we're gonna put that patient on steroids, but when you're done treating that spot, you need to go one further and you need to treat those eyelids to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Because you can't just keep putting them on steroids. I mean, I guess you could, but I wouldn't want to. So I like to treat their lids, remove the staff, clean up those lids, just get that eye to be as white as possible. And then they don't have to have this happen again. Um, so another one where I try to get the eyes to be as clean as possible is when patients have prosthetic eyes. Um, I was at a center where we did a lot of um, bacterial um, plating and I got to like send off gross mucusy stuff and figure out what it was. And almost every single time I had a patient present to me with a mucoid infection and they had a prosthesis, it came up um, pseudomonas. And so um, I, after having, I had like five. Um, and so now I'm pretty quick to say like, okay, look, like I want you to wet this eye, even though it's fake, you have real eyelids. And so um, I want to make sure that there's something between your prosthesis and your eyelid so that it doesn't rub, it doesn't get sticky. Um, a lot of times, like if you look at these people and they've got all kinds of stuff stuck on their eye, their fake eye, then you've got to clean that off. But I don't do that. I send it back to the oculus to do that. Um, but I did think it was funny that you could buy, you know, a prosthetic eye on eBay in case anyone's looking for one. If you got like that eye color, then there's your perfect eye right there. Um, it's kind of shocking what you can buy online these days. But um, the one thing that I thought was interesting about this was um, this study found that um, the mucoid infections, they were actually more frequent if people took out the prosthetic more. And they didn't really know if that was because were they cleaning the prosthesis more because it was gross or like was the infection there because they were cleaning it more often and maybe they were having some type of sensitivity to the cleaning solution, which I thought was really interesting. So um, basically, you know, we wetting, maybe if they are cleaning it a lot, try to change what they're cleaning it with. Um, if they aren't cleaning it at all, then they need to clean it more. If you have a lot of deposits on it, prefer them to have those cleaned off. Um, in my patients that have glaucoma surgery or blebs, I don't like those eyes to be red or uncomfortable or inflamed either. Um, I have seen um, a horrendous bacterial endophthalmitis from a bleb, and I don't ever want to say that again. And uh, I was like scarred for life, apparently. So um, when I have a patient with the bleb, I'm always really careful. I always say, like, if you touch your upper lid, I don't want it to hurt. If you pull your lid up and you know, look in the mirror, make sure it's not red. I want you to do that every day. Um, we clean those lids, make sure that they are clean. I will do that with, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about lid preps in a second. Um, and then when we talk about um, outcomes with cataract surgery, when, we're, when we have those patients that are, you know, they pay the money for the flex and they've, they're all gung-ho to do the femtosecond lasers. But the thing is like, they're gonna get that increase in inflammation just like everybody else that had cataract surgery. And you don't want that to get worse. And some studies have actually shown that those, the inflammation is actually worse after flax because they basically had two procedures, not just one. Um, and so I wanna keep those eyes as quiet as possible. Um, and the other thing is those people just paid a ton of money and used drops for four weeks and they don't wanna use any more drops. 
So a lot of times like you'll find these problems like they might have a really poor tear breakup. They may have persistent corneal staining at that one month visit or maybe they'll come in at the one month and they'll be like, oh my God, my eyes are driving me crazy. I wish I never had surgery. So in those cases, I will try to not use tears. So that's when a lot of times I'll pull out my omega-3 supplements. I'll pull out my lip preps because they just got done using tears and they don't want to use tears anymore. So um, I'm going to, I do a lot of the lip preps that I will talk about in a second. So when you have a patient that presents with mild lid disease, um, like this doesn't look that bad, um, but there's maybe a little bit of injection here. Um, there's a little sort of ditzel right here, and that looks like they might be developing something right there. Their glands are looking okay. Um, I didn't, I don't have any stain in this picture, but this is kind of where you want to step in and be like, um, we might want to work on your eyelids a little bit. And then this is when like I might take pictures, like this is a really good example and be like, say I got this little bubby thing on your lid. I don't want you to develop any more of those. Um, and one of the ways that we can keep that from happening is to do some really simple things, omega-3 fatty acids, maybe just clean your lids in a special way um, to keep this from progressing. So this is- um, I have three of, questions. Okay, go ahead. One of which kind of applies to this. Um, I, so this question is I've heard mixed things about manual Mybomian gland expression by the doctors in the slit lamp. Some say definitely express the glands at all visits and others caution against applying so much pressure because they're sensitive. What's your perspective? So yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about this. So um, I actually am still in the expression camp. Um, I do it with um, a paddle. So I try not to push too, too hard. And, I'll, and I don't like push really hard to the point where the patient is like, ouch. Um, in the hopes that maybe I'm not killing the glands on my own. Um, I do think you need to do the expression though after a hot compress. I'm not a fan of doing expression on a cold lid. Um, and I do like it better with a paddle than with um, against a Q-tip. Although if it's really focal, sometimes I will do it against the uh, swab. Um, I hope that answers that question. What's the other question? Uh, what paddle do you use? Uh, okay, I got it from Bruder. I think it might be the Carpecki paddle. I don't know. I don't know what its name is, but it's the one with like the little circles on either side. And then what omega-3? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I have a little roller one too, but the patients hate that. <laughs> they don't like that at all. So I have it, but I don't use it because they all hate me if I do. And then what uh, is my omega what omega three supplements and routine? Okay, so um, as a okay, I know that some people are gonna get mad at me when I say this, so don't blast me on the internet. So I kind of try to make that as easy as possible. Um, if the patient has a cardiologist, I say I need you to talk to your cardiologist before you start this. If they're taking any type of aspirin or they've had a heart attack or any cardio significant cardiovascular event, I, I feel you need to go through the cardiologist. Um, if they have GERD or any type of stomach issue, a lot of times I will actually use krill instead of um, fish. And I gotta be honest, that's because I have that problem and I have no trouble with krill and I cannot take fish at all. Um, also, if the patient has trouble swallowing large pills, again, there's no evidence study about that. That's just because I can't swallow pills either. I can't believe I just submitted that on like the internet. But um, so I have to use something really small. So I, a lot of times will say, if we need to be like specific, I will say, I love Nordic Naturals. I like um, PRN, um, Doctors Advantage makes a good one that's not too inexpensive. And then, but a lot of times I have patients that I'm like, just go get krill because it's really easy to swallow and the patients don't taste it as much. And my um, compliance has been better when my, when my patient using krill than when they use fish oil. So. Yeah. I'm sure you're, I just made a whole bunch of people mad, so I'm really sorry. So. Hydro oil um, is also really, really good because it has a GLA in it. That's a little bit expensive. Uh, another question. So patients with prosthetic and gooey stuff, what are you having them to use, use to re-wet any particular type of lubrication? Um, I, so I think there's one, it might be Clarity C that a lot of corneal surgeons will use. Um, Josh, if you have a comment on that, let me know. 
And then, um, but otherwise, I really like Refresh Reliva because I find that that hyaluronic acid um, really tends to kind of create like a liquid shield on the prosthetic and it stays there for a long time. And that is now available in a preservative free. Although again, like Julian said, it's really hard to maneuver that bottle sometimes, um, as well as just a regular with preservative bottle over the counter. And then last question for now, what your, what's your dosage for Doxy for adults, for kids? Do you ask, do you ask the pharmacist again? Um, okay, I don't actually use doxycycline for kids very often, if at all. So you pretty much have to be a teenager, like 15, 16, before I would give a child doxycycline. On, and my kids, I use topical azithromycin. Um, my dosage is typically 50 milligrams. Although if I'm treating, if I'm going to start someone on doxycycline because they have like an ulcer or maybe they have a neurotropic ulcer or their limbal stem cells flaring up, I might go to 100. I always have my patients take it with food. I have them take it um, with a meal, af actually after the meal, and I want them to stay sitting up for 30 minutes after taking the medicine to make sure it doesn't erode their esophagus. That's a little pearl from Jill Autry. I cannot take credit for that at all. And um, the one thing you want to remember about doxycycline is if it's expired, the patient needs to throw it out because it can become like toxic if it's actually expired product. Okay, so I'm getting this now. You turn, you mute yourself when I'm done with my questions. Okay. Yeah, sorry about so, that. You're good to go. Oh, it's good. I got it now. Okay, so um, I, I wanted to show this picture because one, this patient has some mild scalloping right here on the lower lid. And so that's a cue to me that something's going on. And this patient clearly loves her mascara. So um, this is when I might step in and talk to the patient specifically about their makeup. So guys, listen up, because I know you have no idea what I'm talking about. But so number one, what do you use to take off your makeup? So I have been using a product called Cetaphil. It's C-E-T-A-P-H-I-L by Galaderma. And it's the Gentle Skin Cleanser. I've been using that stuff since I was 16 years old um, to wash my face, take off my makeup because a dermatologist told me to, and it is fabulous. Um, I have dry eye myself and I found it to be amazing product. It works better than anything else. And it's super cheap. Cheapest place to get it is at Costco. Um, and yes, I know it has parabens in it. So for Leslie Odell's listening to me, don't blast me on the internet. But, um, and then um, do they take their makeup off all, every night? That's key. Um, I always used to talk about hyperallergenic makeup, like Alme, Clinique, whatever. Um, I'm not a fan of using makeup that like flakes off your face. A lot of the makeup that makes your eyelashes really long does tend to flake off. Like this patient here just has flakes all over her eyes. Um, and um, one thing that is brand new, and I apologize if I'm not supposed to do this, but so you might, guys might have seen this on social media. Um, Leslie O'Dell and colleagues have actually launched uh, Eyes Are the Story. And it is actually eye makeup made by eye doctors. I think it's fabulous. Um, there's all kinds of information about what is not in those products that's in other products that might cause an issue with patients that are like contact lens wearers or have ocular surface disease but still wanna wear makeup. That is like a really, really great option. Um, go there, check it out. Eyes are the story. Um, I don't, I'm not a colleague in that at all. Um, like I'm not in, I, I'm not financially in it. Um, but, um, but those are things that I talk about to a lot of my patients when it comes to like their makeup and, um, another thing, and I don't know if this is only in Alabama, I, but teenage girls actually will often use Sharpies to do their eyeliner, which is horrifying. Um, but they will actually take the Sharpie and put it on this lower in the inner margin because it makes them look really black and makes their eyes look really bold and that horrifies me. Um, and so my staff think it's really funny and they will actually like tape Sharpies to my computer as a joke sometimes. But um, that's one thing to look out for. So like when you look at patients, if their makeup is inside the lash line, that is a no-no. You do not want to put eye makeup on that inner margin because it actually blocks the glands and it's going to make those my Bowman glands go away. And we're already doing that enough with our cell phones and computers. So it's not a good idea. Um, does anyone else have any questions Question. about makeup, Marianne? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What about tea tree lid foam cleansers and oils? Oh, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. 
Okay, so we want to break the cycle with um, our lid care. So we want to reduce the bacteria, you want to get rid of the biofilms, and you want to reduce the inflammation. And so um, we can do that using a whole bunch of stuff, topical steroids, but you don't want to leave patients on that for a long, long time. I like to use topical NSAIDs for patients that are in a lot of pain, but I don't like to do that long term because it's expensive. Omega-3 fatty acids, love them. It's almost always one of my first line, unless it's contraindicated for blood thinners um, or again, cardiovascular events in the patient's history. The problem that I find with omega-3 fatty acids is a lot of other doctors in, like, involved with that patient's care will tell the patient to stop them. That drives me crazy. So I, let you, I kind of like go one level above like just why I want you to use this but also why I don't want you to stop them. Like if your doctor tells you they want you to stop it, I want you to let me know. Maybe I can have a talk with your doctor and see if there's something else we can try. I am a huge fan of oral doxycycline, like I said, but take it after meals. Don't lay down right afterward. And you gotta watch out for stomach upset, which can happen at any point in treatment. Topical azithromycin, love it in children, but it comes in a little tiny bottle that everyone thinks is empty. And the patients always call and yell at me when they get it from the pharmacy. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about three lid preparations, which because of like the negatives that went with everything else I just talked about, I've actually been using a whole lot more of. So that's hypochlorous acid, okra formulations, and tea tree oil. So first of all, I despise baby shampoo. I don't understand why anyone thinks that's a good idea. So even before 2013, I didn't think it was a good idea. So in 2013, yeah, they made it better by taking out the formaldehyde and the dioxane, but it still has fragrance. Now the problem with makeup or any type of like shampoos, whatever, anything that's labeled fragrance, that's the way the company can hide whatever's in that product. Um, it's one of the ways they hide their secret ingredient, but it's also one way they can hide bad stuff. So um, anything that's a fragrance, that's bad. Um, the phenoxyethanol, that's bad. That causes all kinds of irritation to the skin, can cause allergies. Um, anything that causes dermatitis, I don't want that stuff in my patient's eyes. And let's face it, I don't like the idea of using a detergent in my eye. Like if we're having a rewetting problem or we're having an evaporative cure problem, putting soap into that mix, I'm sorry, that's just stupid. So I don't like them using baby shampoo. And so I tell them all the time, is getting soap in, in your eye a good idea? They're like, no. I'm like, okay, then why are you using baby shampoo? That doesn't make any sense. Um, I like to use products which are going to reduce bacteria, reduce inflammation, and aid in healing. And so tea tree hypochlorous and um, this okra thing that we're going to talk about, they do, they do that. So hypochlorous acid is really effective in killing bacteria and viruses. It also works against listeria. It works against MRSA. Um, and it's so easy to use. And so it typically comes in a spray or in a gel. And I gotta be honest, guys, you don't know how to do any of this stuff. So a lot of times I'll have my men use spray and I'll just be like, just close your eyes, spray, spray, and then just kind of rub it off with either a clean washcloth or um, those makeup rounds. And then they look at you blankly and I'm like, you're gonna have to have your wife go get one for you. Um, women, we get the gel. I'm, I like the gel a little bit better. Um, and again, with the gel, I just have them wash their hands put a little dab of the gel in their fingers, rub it into the eyelashes for 30 seconds, and then wipe it off with either a clean wet washcloth or a makeup round. Um, I like them, my women, to do that after they take off their makeup at night. Um, but if the patient is having a lot of discharge in the morning, I might have them do it twice. So if there's discharge in the morning, do it in the morning. If they're women and they're taking off their makeup, do it at night. So yes, sometimes women have to do it twice. Um, Okay. I'm just letting you know you have five till the hour, and there's one more question. I didn't know if you wanted to wait till the very end, but the question is advice for management of recurrent chalazion. I love IPL. I love super hot compresses using um, like a like a mask. Um, that's key. Maybe twice a day, um, and um, maybe that's when I might have them on doxycycline. Um, I love the IPLs though for that, that works really well. So, so just really, really quick. So I have like no time, right? So um, 
take, take a screenshot of this one. So okra is zocular. This stuff is amazing. So um, I, this patient right here, this patient had all kinds of dermatitis. She was actually reacting to her CPAP mask. And so after using, I did a bunch of stuff. We've done IPL, she's done literally everything. But um, she keeps her face looking that good because one, she's using okra every day. Um, and two, we actually switched her CPAP mask to a mouth mask. So now she's not, doesn't have a mask on her face at all. So these, if you want to screenshot that, that's the references for like why okra is so amazing. Um, but that stuff is like honey for the eye. It's awesome. It's like this natural killer of everything. It's great. Um, and then last thing is the Demodex. We want to, like, if you ever see those, like the lash, the lash bases looking like that, then you want to reach for that tea tree oil. Um, there's like three things that I will do a lot too. I, I, I love tea tree oil. I do like the Ocusoft Lid Scrubs Plus, but I like the tea tree oil better because let's face it, it smells better and the patients just like it better because it smells better. Um, you can do like the manual debridement. Um, I actually have a Blefex and it's so great in theory and it works so well, but the patients hate it because it really hurts. So. Um, again, hot compress method is really important. I'm not a fan, like running water doesn't do it. Hot washcloths alone, don't do it. You have to do a 10 minute constant heat application or it doesn't work. And that's it. So, um, uh, now we need everyone to log off and then log back on for the next course. And thank you so much for paying attention.